Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis, the web's talk show about Gnosticism, the ancient Gnostics, modern Gnosticism, mysticism, art, poetry, and the great thinkers of history and whatever else we feel like talking about. I'm your host, Jonathan Stewart. I'm joined by my co-host, Jason Memel. Hello, Jason. Hello there. A uh, show that is uh, 10 years in the making. I was telling our guest that I thought that we had already done a William Blake show in one of the previous incarnations of Talk Gnosis. We hadn't. So today we are fixing a huge mistake as we talk about one of the most brilliant people to have ever lived. And to join us to talk about this visionary uh, man who's changed my life, and if he hasn't changed your life, will change it in the future, to talk about William Blake, we have scholar and writer Jason Whitaker. Hello, Jason. Hello, pleasure to be here. Uh, it's really awesome to have you here again because uh, you are helping us correct uh, a, a huge error in our wonderful programming. Um, and it's uh, uh, really, hey, J Jason Memo, you know, you ever notice a great thing about Gnosticism is it, it completely removes original sin, right? It's we're, we're naturally good people underneath it all, or we all have the divine spark. And hence, guilt doesn't motivate us, right? Uh, you don't want well, to use not, guilt as a motivator. Yeah, uh, it's not the first motivator. <laughs> no. So, yeah. you know, that's why I'm saying we actually need your financial support, you the audience, <laughs> to keep the show going. But we don't want to guilt you about it. <laughs> but if you want to help spread the light of Gnosis, you can do so for as little as a dollar per piece of media, to uh, a dollar per piece of media per month. So go to paypal.com slash Gnostic. <coughs> you can sign up there. We can put a cap in case we do a lot of media that month. You only want to spend five dollars. You're worried we're going to release a billion podcasts. Just set up to five. Uh, the other thing you can do as well is uh, okay. So Patreon.com/slash Gnostic. Here's the right link. PayPal.com/slash Gnostic for one-time donations. And if you can't help us out financially, we completely understand. If you do become a patron, we give you the shows uh, early, a week to up to two weeks early. We try to give you other things as well. I'm trying to figure out things to give you. Maybe an NFT of my soul, although you know, maybe that'd be <laughs> the NFT of the Cephian counter uh, counterfeit spirit that's within me. Um, but yes, however, if you can't help us out financially. Uh, to replace these satanic mills with the new Jerusalem, then what you can do is tell people about the show, share the show, like and subscribe, leave reviews, uh, good reviews, and um, just take your favorite episode, email it to a friend. So all that would help us out immensely. Now it is time to start. Uh, Jason Whitaker. Uh, can you tell us a, a bit about what drew you to William Blake and his work? Like, how did you find it? How did it affect you? How does it affect you now? Why does it matter to you? So I was 19 years old when I really encountered Blake for the first time properly. I, I, at school, we, we kind of read The Tiger. You know, th this was universal in, in English UK schools at the time. But it was actually when I went to university. And there, there were two related events, as it were. So first of all, on my my wall as a student, you know, the the along with the Che Guevara posters and what have you, there was also uh, an image of the Ancient of Days. So you know, the the figure of what I later learnt was Eurism, but looked like God reaching out of the sun with this compass to draw the universe um, in the abyss. Alongside that, the the other thing that really that that actually had a more immediate and profound effect was that I read the Marriage of Heaven and Hell. Now, I had gone to university as a very uh, orthodox practicing Catholic, actually. Um, I was raised Catholic, came from a strongly Catholic family, and I got to university, and that started to crumble for a whole host of reasons. And I read this book, which basically said, you know, everything you know about everything is wrong. That's... Jesus was not on the side of God and the angels, but of the devils, that he wanted to turn the universe upside down, that the reason why Milton was a true poet um, was that he was of the devil's party without knowing it. And, but also what was really interesting was that <laughs> you know, my, my degree, my original degree was actually in English literature and theology. And, but, 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 Unsurprisingly, I think for you know university in the 1980s, I was surrounded by an awful lot of atheists and materialists, you know, Marxists and and people who are critique, critiquing and uh, seeking to dismantle the system. 
And at the same time, I was then reading this person who was more radical than many of those in his, his kind of political beliefs, but also still profoundly, and, and, and I'm going to use the word spiritual. One of the problems I've had in 30 years is actually finding the right word to describe Blake's religious spiritual belief system. Um, and, and even writing this book recently, Divine Images, about essentially Blake's spiritual views, I have struggled to find the right word. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, this evening. So that's, that literally, as, as I've said many times, that, that turned the light bulb on. And one of the things about this is that it went on and has never gone off since. Now I've written over the past 30 years, I've written about a number of subjects. I was a tech journalist for a while. I've written on different poets, uh, you know, very much interested in romanticism. After a while, I kind of do that subject and then get a bit bored of it and move on to the next thing. Blake is literally the one artist and writer who I have never grown bored of. Hmm. Oh, John, it looks like you're muted. <laughs> okay, I was muted there, but you know, that's actually probably a good thing. <laughs> no, uh, 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 Jason, I, I don't even uh, engage with, you know, poetry in the same way that you would professionally, semi professionally as an intellectual uh, in other works. But same thing for me, Blake is eternally fresh for me. I, I come back to him and, and it's always something new. It's always something startling. And I was saying to my partner last night, he wasn't just ahead of his time. He's ahead of our time. He's ahead of all conceivable times. Um, can you give us a, a brief outline of his life, sort of a, the elevator pitch version of his biography? Yeah. Um, so uh, keeping this as brief as possible, <laughs> and I, I love the plug for my book, so of course I'll direct everybody there. Um, <laughs> born in Soho in London, in the West End. I, I mean, actually, the, 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 there was a long attempt to try and make Blake, you know, sort of amongst the poorest, you know, a, a working class, very poor, but actually he came from a respectable, lower middle class family. His, fam his father ran a haberdasher's, um, they, 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 they were, you know, relatively wealthy, certainly very well respected. Um, fortunately for Blake as well, compared to the, stands of the standards of the day, they were incredibly enlightened. They kind of realized that their son from a young age demonstrated this artistic talent and was not going to do well at school. So they effectively started by homeschooling him and then made the very reasonable decision to apprentice him. And they realized that, you know, that although, although they weren't poor, Blake had to have a trade. He would have to have something to allow him to make a living throughout his life. So they apprenticed him to an engraver called James Bezier, um, who specialised in kind of antiquarian and historical documents. And this was incredibly influential then on Blake's later style. And, and Blake trained to be an engraver. Um, I often think, you know, that the, the easiest way to think of what Blake's job was, his trade, is more like a graphic designer of today. You know, his job was to take ideas and produce branding and reproductions and kind of um, the, the kind of the print visual culture stuff that was incredibly important to the day. Um, as he grew older, uh, um, one of the most important decisions he ever made was to marry Catherine, who not simply because they clearly were aligned in terms of their their ideas and approach to a great many things but she was also practically incredibly important particularly when blake did become poorer um, the blakes became poorer as they grew older he couldn't afford an assistance anymore and catherine was essential to help him actually perform his task printing worked in such a way that you can't it's not a one-man job you needed somebody else to help you actually prepare and produce your prints so living in london trying to make his name as a, as a printer, as an engraver. Um, also then starting to produce these incredibly original works, which actually very few people read during his lifetime. Um, at a time when London was incredibly, in increasingly dangerous for people with radical tendencies. Blake had supported the French Revolution, had very strong democratic ideals. And in 1800, his friends essentially recommended that he leave London, sort of go and take a break away from a city which was increasingly full of spies and authorities who wanted to crack down on dissent. So for the one period in his life between 1800 and 1803, he moved to the South Coast, to a small village called Felpham, um, just outside Chichester. Um, these, th this began incredibly wonderfully, I and mean, this is the period he composed what became known later as the Hymn Jerusalem. Um, but it ended very badly when he entered into an altercation with a soldier who accused him of sedition. 
mm. and Blake was tried for this, found not guilty, although in the book that I'm, I'm writing at the moment, I, I, I kind of argue that Blake probably was technically guilty of sedition at this point. Um, and he returned to London and to increasing obscurity. I mean, he, he, he's increasingly gaining a reputation as, as a difficult person to work with. Um, his style was increasingly old fashioned. You know, the skills he'd learned as a young man were, were falling out of favor. And he spent a period then of great obscurity in which um, there's a period of 10 years where there is very little, in fact, virtually, in fact, there's no commercial print work for Blake. Um, and, and he and Catherine were falling into to, to greater um, poverty. The end of his life, however, he was um, befriended by uh, uh, another artist called John Linnell. And around him, so in the, the final decade of his life, he drew this, this small coterie of other painters, engravers and artists who became known as the Shoreham Ancients. And they kind of recognized that, that what Blake was doing, the, the art he was producing, was incredibly different to anything else that was, was popular in this romantic period. And so it was that by the time of Blake's death, he, he was obscure, but not unknown. But he also then had a very small, dedicated group of followers who actually, and, and you see this most in, in one artist I'll just pick out, Samuel Palmer. Palmer's early artwork is astonishing. It's kind of a, a pre figuration of the pre-Raphaelites, pre for example, of ultimately kind of things that lead into impressionistic art. And so Blake himself, this, this, in, his, in his early days, he'd actually been quite well known, certainly on the London scene. He ended his life in obscurity. Um, but then, of course, within 30 years or so after his death, started his, his artwork was rediscovered and he became incredibly influential on later generations. Yes. Uh, it just blows my mind that he could have been obscure during his life and uh, while creating uh, th these remarkable works. And even I, I understand that his techniques and in a way some of his style would have been seen as old fashioned. There's, there is a, a strange primitivism mm. to it, but at the same time I still find it completely different from any of his contemporaries and even completely different from uh, just about uh, anything else. So uh, yeah, it's really, uh, that, that all, all I can say is, is mind blowing uh, that this genius is wandering around London in, in semi-obscurity though. I'm sure many people listening are, are happy and watching are, are happy to know that he had those, that dedicated circle and people who did, a, did appreciate. Uh, him. Uh, <clears throat> Jason, is it true that he is literally a visionary? That is, he had visions that he viewed as divine visions starting at an early age? That is a question that <laughs> I'm hesitating because it's a question that appears simple to answer in the sense of yes. He seems to have been possessed of an eidetic imagination. He literally could summon up images in front of him so very strong imagination the thing that the the reason why i hesitate slightly is that blake himself was incredibly sophisticated as a thinker blake was fully aware that these eidetic images that he was conjuring up before him were products of his imagination but for him imagination was that divine spark um and when we come to later to talk about gnosticism i'll probably argue that for blake what what what's that, that divine light that probably appeals to um, you know Gnostic uh, theologies is actually for Blake the imagination. This is the thing that he returns to again and again as the source of the divine. So Blake himself could be, I don't want to use the word materialist because he would have had incredible problems about that, but he was fully accepting that, in fact, it was incredibly important to him that his vision was human. It was a human faculty but it was precisely in the exercise of that human faculty that he saw God. Uh, I'll, give, I'll give one brief example of kind of this in practice. Towards the end of his life, this friendship with John Lennon, um, he also befriended another artist, a, a painter called John Varley. And I've got, I've got a big soft, I've got a soft spot for John Varley. John Varley was um, an incredibly successful romantic painter. You know, if you see Varley's paintings now, there's a lot of them in the UK. There are all these vast sweeping landscapes of mountains and l rivers and lakes. Beautiful and entirely forgettable. You know, the sort of thing you'd find on a, a, a fancy chocolate box tin or something like that. He was also incredibly wealthy at this, but he also had so many debts that his money just disappeared through his fingers. He was also a fairly 
straight practicing occultist. He was fascinated by the occult. And he'd heard about this artist in London, Blake, who had had these visions, saw these things. And Blake would go around his house and pick up his notebook and say, oh yeah, there's King David sitting in the corner. Or, oh, you know, oh no, over there is the man who bought the, that built the first pyramids. And you know, there, there's um, the, you know, the Prince of Scotland and stuff. And, and Varley would be jumping around looking for where this spirit was, expecting to see this, this literal vision. And, and, and Blake's friend Linnell said, you know, he was basically mocking Varley. He, he was just making this stuff up. <laughs> but I mean, the one, the one that, that then it, it gives an example of that this is the beginning of a divine visage, visage yes. vision rather, is the image of the ghost of a flea. So Blake sees this, this head, this scaly head with a kind of articulated tongue drinking blood from a bowl. And it becomes, if you like, it becomes an image of Satan. It becomes an image of evil. It becomes, he, he literally makes it in oil and tempera, um, sorry, tempera paint on board, paints it in gold, and he, he embodies this image that he sees. Uh, and so for Blake, seeing visions, divine visions, are when our imagination becomes art. It is a thoroughly human activity, but for Blake, it's the human form divine that actually is the basis of all our spirituality right so if i if i was going to sum up what you're saying uh, is that uh blake would say that he's using his imagination these visions come from his imagination and in sort of modern parlance if you, if you made a statement like that then it'd be like oh okay he's just imagining it but for him imagination is the conduit the connector uh uh to the divine a, a divine reality in and of itself is that right? It is. It is the divine. Um, I mean, if the, the earliest phrase he uses in his book, All Religions Are One, he calls it the poetic genius. And he's very much aware that, that it poetic, as in the original Greek poesis, the making. It is an act of creation is the divine image. So imagination is an act of creation. We literally make gods. Every deity resides in the human breast, as, as he says um, in his poetry. Yeah. Well, before the, I move the, on to the next question. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say uh, Jason Memo. Yeah, I, was just gonna, <laughs> I was just gonna dive in there like because I, I think there's something uh, like because in a way it's not just imagination it's not just unbridled uh, um, you know free association imagination but it is imagination with craft with with uh, uh, intent or at least um, uh, at least with effort maybe would be another way to say it that I'm is at least a, a vibe that I'm getting um, is is the uh, is there an element here in which, uh, Blake is recognizing that, like, that the 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 divinities that he's reaching for might not be a thing the human mind can comprehend, but that the work of imagination and art, art and craft, are like the rungs to get us there. Um, good question. I, 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 I would say no, I, I, okay. if, if I understand where you're going correctly. But um, if, if I could approach it a slight different way, there's um, a, a distinction that's useful for me is um, Coleridge in the Biographia Literaria, where he talks about the different types of imagination. And um, ironically, in a passage which it was later shown that he'd ripped off from a German scholar called Maas, who in turn was influenced <laughs> by Kant. Um, and, and Coleridge dis distinguishes, first of all, between fancy and imagination. So fancy is very often what people think about and think about imagination. You know, it's sticking things together, you know, you, you know the, the head of a bull on the body of a man to make the minotaur. And, it, and it's, it's that kind of fairly low level free association. Coleridge then distinguishes in, in imagination itself. That what you were talking about in part there is that, that in, um, thoughts that are directed into art and craft. But actually Coleridge himself distinguishes a higher level than this called the primary imagination. And this is the act whereby you become in a sense of fully self-reflecting, self, fully conscious perceptual being. Um, it's, it's that moment when you go out and you know, you look on the sun rising in the morning and it is as though that is the very first time that the sun rose. And you, in your act of perception, you are creating that sense of the sun rising at that moment. You are creating in an act of God at that moment. And, and but it's also so it's that, that that kind of that, that literal enlightenment, uh, the moment when you know the light bulb goes on to use by by crass earlier analogy. <laughs> and Blake himself, I mean, he gave he gave an example, a wonderful example of this of how important this imaginationist perception is. In a conversation with a German journalist called Henry Crabb Robinson, um, 
Blake said, you know, when, when you go out and look at the sun, I don't see, you know, a gold disc in the si sky the size of a, a guinea, you know, a coin hanging in, 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 in the blue. What I see is a host of heavenly angels singing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now, Blake himself, he's a poet. He's an artist. He knows he is making this stuff up. But in the process of making this stuff up, he is transforming the way he sees the world. So art is vital. I mean, it, later, hopefully we'll come on to this later. I mean, he describes Jesus as an artist. What the artist does is by an act of making, they transform the way that we see the world around us. This is why art is divine. I'm not sure that entirely answers your question. So if not, please. It come kind back. of, yeah, it kind of does. Like there's a, a, a poet here in Calgary, uh, Richard Harrison, who uh, I'm a big fan of, um, I'm just a brilliant, uh, uh, poet and and uh, and thinker, um, uh, not necessarily Blakeian in his style, but uh, but I think goes into some interesting places. And also, I should note, uh, goes into some uh, comic book places. Um, he's a, he's a big comic book fan and has poetry on Jack Kirby. Which uh, anyway, before I go on to Richard's <laughs> biography, uh, bibliography, my point was actually is that uh, uh, when Richard and I have been talking, and as I've uh, worked on some some poetry workshops with him. Uh, one of the things he's talked about is a lyricizing of life. Like mm -hmm. sometimes yes. you will, in the process of consuming art, um, particularly poetry, but but prose, uh, visual art, etc., yeah. you will find that something has been described that you did not know you had a you did not know you needed a term for, but you have always experienced. And once you've seen that that artistic extrapolation of it it has now been sort of instantiated for you. You're like, oh, that writer just gave me a way to describe what that first glass of water in the morning feels like, yes. you know, yes. um, which before was like unnarrated for me. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I think I'm not, that's not ultimately a question. I think I'm just kind of responding, I think, to what uh, you're saying. What, 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 uh, the, the, I can't remember the name now. I was reading it a few weeks ago, um, but the comments that, you know, the act of creation, so, so artistic creation, the, the act of making something is that moment when you change the universe so that this new thing can fit mm -hmm. into it. And that, that just, I think, is such a wonderful way to think of the universe. You know, every moment mm -hmm. we make something, the universe changes itself to fit that element into it. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I want to go down a few different rabbit holes there. John, maybe <laughs> yes. you go back to your question list there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. We should have time, Jason. So, uh, so yeah. feel free, feel free to, uh, to dive into those rabbit holes. But I guess actually talking about his work, and I know Jason Whitaker, this is quite difficult to do, right? It's like it's like asking you to talk about uh, uh, poetry and visual art is. Oh, it would be like asking you to do an interpretive dance about it, right? <laughs> right. It's very hard to discuss these things. But if you could try to tell us what is it that set both his visual art and his poetry and his writing uh, apart from his contemporaries, what made yes. them different? Uh, the... um, I mean, one thing that I'd start, I'd start answering by that, by first of all, drawing attention to where his art was like that of his contemporaries, because there's very much that he does, which is very different. But also then, um, it's easier sometimes to see where he is different by seeing where he was most alike. So, so in Blake's commercial work, for example, um, if you if you were if you had a um, a collection of Blake's commercial works, such as that produced by Robert Essick on Blake's commercial prints, you would not recognise William Blake. William Blake Blake as a professional could produce engravings that followed that kind of increasingly realistic view of of art you know in the 18th century well from the 17th century onwards really that this this inheritance of the post renaissance period was to try and make art that reflected the world so art is a mirror of life and if you look at most of blake's engraved engraved work that's produced commercially he's given paintings by other artists and he has to reproduce those in graphic form so so if Blake had simply produced these, we'd see that he was a very skilled craftsman, but not what we'd understand by as an artist. So sticking with his, his uh, oh, actually, no, I'll, I'll just draw, then draw attention to his poetry can also then, it's part of a continuum. So actually, if you read particularly his first book, Poetical Sketches, what you see is a young man. He started writing these, these works when he was 14 and, until his early 20s. 
and he's absorbing Shakespeare, but he's also absorbing people like Thomas Gray, Collins. He's absorbing a lot of those mid 18th century contemporaries who are very concerned with sentiment. You know, set, set the age of sentiment was not an invention of the Romantics, it preceded them. So, so a lot of Blake's work is kind of, has its roots in convention. He doesn't appear out of nowhere. The big change that happens, and I'll start first of all with his art, his visual art, is that at a certain point, and this seems to emerge at quite an early age, Blake decides that what he wants to do as an artist, and particularly with his own original works, is he does not want to imitate the world out there. He wants to kind of retreat into the world inside, into the world mentally, you know, emotionally within his own body. Um, and I'll give one example of this, or a series, a collection of groups which are of paintings, of prints, which are really quite famous, the, the large colour prints. So if you've ever seen Newton, again, sitting on a rock with the, the compass, um, Elohim creating Adam, sort of drawing him out um, of the, the, the earth, um, a lot of biblical subjects, but also then sort of pity, the, a figure of a woman scooping up a young child as, as it lifting her up from a, a dying woman. Um, as she rides away on horseback. These are, you cannot go out into the world and see, you know, uh, Nebuchadnezzar with his long beard and turning into an animal. These are entirely mental creations. Um, and this is where people struggled with Blake during his lifetime, because the paradigm for visual art in particular, um, in, the mid in the Middle Ages, people have gone, yeah, see that all the time, you know, angels, devils, <laughs> eternal spirits, that's common. But but the Enlightenment and the post-Lockean epistemology had such a grip on public imagination that art was there to reflect the world. And art that did not reflect the world was not real. So Blake himself kind of like, actually, no, the internal world that I experience is just as real as the external world. In fact, the external world only comes to life when my desires, my imagination, my, my mental life brings it to life. So Blake dedicates himself to depicting this internal world, which to be honest is not widely accepted then until the end of the 19th century with Impressionism and, and, and the Surrealists are a great example of this. You know, the Surrealists claim Blake as one of their precursors, the, 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 the artist who's concerned with the world of dreams, a world of vision. In his poetry, the single most thing, there's lots of things, but the one I'll just concentrate as an example, the single most important thing that sets him apart from his peers, and indeed until most writers until the late 19th century, is that he creates his own mythology. Now, Blake as an artist, Blake as an artist creating or working with myth is, that's not, that's nothing exceptional. You know, if you think about the origins of most art, particularly during the, you know, that medieval period, but even very often in the classical world, had its origins in a sacred space of some shape, you know, connections to whether it was, you know, commissioned by the church or simply part of kind of rites and mysteries um, of different cultic groups. Mythology had always informed art until the enlightenment. And that, that's where, you know, kind of a, the secularization of art takes place. But Blake is, I think, I'm, I don't know an earlier example, Blake is the first artist to create his own mythology. Mm. Now in the 20th century, in the 21st century, you only have to look at, you know, I'm take Tolkien, The Lord of the Rings, Middle Earth, um, take, you know, uh, C.S. Lewis, Narnia, etc. We're, we're used now to writers inventing worlds, inventing cosmologies. That did not happen in the 19th, the 18th and early 19th centuries. Even when writers are being exotic, for example, my favorite, it's not much read now, Robert Southey. Southey was incredibly well read. He writes, you know, books like uh, The Curse of Kahama, Thalaba the Destroyer, uh, drawing upon South American myth, drawing upon Hindu mythology. But again, it's drawing on pre-existing systems. Yeah. Blake, as, as he wrote in um, Jerusalem, The Emanation of the Giant Albion, I must create a system or be enslaved by another man's. I will not reason and compare. My task is to create. And the problem for his contemporaries is, you know, they're really going, who the hell is Eurism? You know, Tharmas, what's that? Any Tharman? 
that they have no reference point for this. And indeed, there's not a sense of the practice of this. I, 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 that, that where Blake got the ideas from this were, were very much from kind of um, mystical or occult thinkers. I'm thinking of people like Jakob Burma and Paracelsus, etc. This practice of inventing, you know, kind of systems of angels, etc. Or indeed Swedenborg was another important one. But Blake is the first one to literally try and create an entire mythology that does not automatically reference a pre-existing system. Right. Well, I guess this is a perfect lead in. Um, a lot of people have noticed that this mythology sometimes and in some ways resembles Gnosticism. So I guess I have a few questions about it, which yeah. is, did he actually, and I put this in quotes, quote unquote, believe his mythology? Or was it more like in, in a religious sense? Or was it more of an artistic construction? And then the second um, uh, part of that question is, I guess if you can tell us a, a bit about this mythology and primary figures, and, and I know it can get quite elaborate, so uh, feel free yeah. to you know, give the quick version. <laughs> um, to answer the first question, um, if you don't mind saying, I, I think for Blake, there's a false dichotomy there. You know, does he believe yeah. in it as a religion or is it an artistic practice? They are in, inseparable for Blake. You know, it, it, literally in, in the Laocoon, Jesus was an artist, the disciples were artists. Um, concocting, I mean, to, to give an example of how that's so important for Blake, you know, his view of J Jesus Christ is that this, this carpenter's son from Galilee uh, invented a whole new religion by going around telling people, wouldn't it be great if God was like a loving father, um, telling stories. Uh, and, and that's the important point, that Christ told parables, he told stories, he used imagination to construct this new idea of the divine so so for blake art is religion i'll, I'll give an, uh, it's some work I'm, I'm planning to do actually the uh, modernist writer t hume um in a, an essay on classicism and romanticism he described romanticism as spilt religion and he said that you know sort of one that one of the big mistakes of of the enlightenment was that by repressing our desires for some kind of ecstasis, some kind of sense of the, the divine outside of ourselves. Uh, those desires did not go, go away. And actually what happened for Hume is that um, poetry stepped in, romanticism sets in. And, and, and Hume, whilst being sympathetic, thinks this is a bad thing. You know, he, he's, he's, he's ultimately a classicist. But he says that, you know, romanticism is spilt religion. It's, it's where the feelings and desires and emotions of religion will go if they don't have any other outlet. The reason why I think this is wrong, or, uh, uh, in, in Blake's view, religion is spilt poetry, mm. is spilt art. Um, in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, um, this is one of the most profound. I, I've, I, when I first read this, I was 19. It has never ceased to have the same astonishing effect on me when I read it now in my 50s. Um, Plate 11, he talks about how the ancient poets used to go around animating trees and spirit, uh, lakes and towns and forests with spirits. So literally, the, the beginnings of religious life, of the divine life, are people wandering around sort of going, you know, seeing nymphs and sylphs and, and gods and deities and, and leaving gifts and, and engaging, you know, what Martin Buber calls this, you know, the I-thou relationship with the natural world. This is an act of poetry. This is an act of creation, of making. And then Blake says, and what happens then is then priestcraft comes in and tries to make it into systems and structures of belief. So in that sense, if, if, to answer your question, if, if Blake believed in it in, in the way that religion works, he would say no, because for him, religion is a perversion of the, old, the, the original divine. But Blake utterly, utterly has faith in the ability of human imagination to create the universe anew. To, to make it shift and change. I mean, I, it still blows my mind when I think about it. If you take that one image of 1725 of Newton sitting um, on a rock with the, the compass, which is, you know, a, a statue by um, Eduardo Paolazzi outside the, the British Library in London. In 1795, 1794, that image didn't exist. In 1795, Blake prints that and paints up that image of Newton on, the, on, on, on a rock. 
and starts a long, slow process whereby in the 21st century, you can go to the British Library and see a bronze statue of Blake's Newton with modifications and realize that for a lot of people, such as myself, you know, Blake scholars obviously, but I think, you know, wider than that, ripples throughout the universe of people who go, Newton is not the person I once thought he was, that Blake literally transformed the perceptions that people have. So Blake does not believe in his mythology in the sense of a system um, of, you know, sort of the Nicene Creed or something like that. But there are better examples, you know, in terms of, of a, a fairly rigid theology. Um, what he does fundamentally believe in is, is that by the act of creating his zoas, I was going to say deities, but his zoas, his living beasts, um, he has he has found a way to engage in this I thou relationship with the universe by creating these, by making these creations and letting them go, releasing them into the wild. He has he's clearly fundamentally changed his relationship to that universe. And of course, then for subsequent generations who read and see his art, he has thus changed the universe for them. Yeah, I think. So, um, oh, sorry. Did, uh, did you have a last uh, something else to say there? No, I was, I was just going to say I'll go on to talk about that, that mythology, but I just had, was going to pause, you know. Yeah. So please come mm. in. Well, yeah, no, I think I just wanted to really, uh, again, to it's barely a question, just really a, a, a fascinating mm -hmm. response. I love that that notion of like, well, it, like almost that the like, no, he didn't believe in his mythology the way like in that Nicene Creed way, I think, which is really well put. Um, but that also that like the what he's getting at, perhaps, is, uh, is something that like is perhaps deeper than a than uh, like a sort of an almost legalistic statement of belief. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, and also something that's like uh, in a way more challenging. Like it's uh, like, dare you uh, subsume yourself to the level of like engagement that poetry requires versus uh, being given a system and saying, yes, I agree with it or I don't, you know? Yes. Um, uh, th th I'm, I'm just riffing here because like, I think uh, I've done a few uh, uh, conversations with within the AJC about uh, Gnosticism and narrative and Gnosticism and art. And I think I'm just really enjoying a lot of the ideas that you're talking about here. So I'm just, I guess I'm just, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm riffing because this is yes. a lot of fun. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, I, I do, this actually does lead maybe just in terms of the form of his work and like you've talked about his plates and stuff, but I, this does actually kind of lead to a question I want to get to before we run out of time is, um, so, like, I think a lot of people know of Blake as a poet. They might know of Blake as an artist, but like, you know, how much is is it like to truly appreciate Blake? Are you essentially would you be required to make sure you're looking at the plates with the poetry, not just like like I've got a collected Blake here yeah. that doesn't have any yeah. of his paintings in? Yes. You know, yes. um, uh, I've also got like a, a stickers with Blake paintings on them that don't have any of the poetry like okay, um, so i just that like how much do you need to see both at the same time so the, there's a couple of comments i'd make this i mean one of the first thing that i would never want to do never ever want to do is a kind of a blake shaming you know oh you don't you don't study all the work properly therefore how can you know blake um there are a whole host of reasons for this because, because actually that creates that creates barriers for Blake. And Blake did, he actually, uh, well, I was gonna say, he did, some of his later work is so complicated for, for, for reasons we probably don't quite have time to explore, but you know, the simple version is that, you know, when, when he's tried for sedition, his work does start becoming more obscure because it's not safe to actually say what he really wants to say as plainly as he could. Um, there's much more to that, but, but you know, his later work comes obscure, but I think that, that very, Blake wanted an audience, Blake wanted readers. Um, in his later life, before he met the Shoreham Ancients, there's, there's very clear evidence that he was frustrated with the fact that people were not reading his books. So, so the first point to make is that I would never want to say that, you know, you should do this. Um, a more complex version of that, and it's something I wrote about in a book about seven, eight years ago now, um, talking about virtual Blakes. And by virtual Blake, I didn't mean digital Blakes. I didn't mean, you know, things like the Blake archive. I meant the fact that 
whenever we are reading any work of Blake, we're actually dealing with a virtual system. This, this applies to any writer. Unless you have the complete output of their lives, and I don't mean a collected works, I mean literally, you know, the scraps of paper, the notebooks, the, um, you know, the, the, the different editions of their works. You're always dealing with a selection. You're always de dealing with a virtual composite. And actually the artists themselves are dealing with virtual composites of their works. Um, the, there's some work that's been done um, a few years ago now on, on Blake and the Four Zoas. So this huge manuscript, which he never finished. And the, the corrections, the errors, Blake constantly was revising it. And it's quite clear that, you know, the Blake of 17, of 1803, who was working on the Four Zoas, was a completely different person to the Blake of 1797. His ideas had changed, you know, like any person. He wasn't static. So Blake himself was looking at a different version of himself from his immediate past. So, so one kind of that, that there is a fundamental philosophical problem of, of the notion of a complete Blake. So that lets me off the hook a bit. <laughs> you know, I, I, I try as much as possible to get the complete Blake, and it's impossible. I'm, I'm dealing with impossible tasks. Um, that said, I think it's incumbent on anybody who really wants to have, who wants to study Blake. Rather than saying, you know, I love when people come to me, you know, I, I love the, the tiger or whatever. I'm just thrilled. I think that is absolutely fantastic. And I'll just share that moment of joy with them. For when I'm teaching students, for example, I'm saying, you know, you want to go to the next level. Actually, you do need to understand the arts alongside the poetry. I'll, I'll stop with one very simple example. Um, you may, you know, lots of people know the sick rose. Oh, rose, thou art sick, the invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm, has found out thy bed of crimson joy, and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. Incredibly powerful words. But when you see it in the songs of experience with this, you know, this, this rose, this wilted, decaying flower wrapped around with all these fleeing female figures, you realize that, that there's actually a huge element of pathos to that image, which you do not get from the words alone. I mean, the words themselves, I think, are much more sinister than when they're seen in combination with this image. So if you want to study Blake, yeah, you have to... You, the work of illumination requires a visual, it's a multi-sensory perception um, that, that, that's at work there. Yeah, and I, I wasn't, wouldn't uh, suggest to, to Blake shame anybody. Um, uh, but, but people do, uh, but people do, you know, you, you don't know what you're talking about because you haven't studied all this stuff. And it's kind of like, mm. Blake believed his work could be understood by children. And, and sometimes the best readers are children. I, I actually kind of want to like uh, jump into that a bit as well. Like mm. so, uh, just just skimming through Blake uh, in anticipation for this. One thing I did find fascinating as a reaction that I had, like because I love all kinds of poetry. Like my friend Richard, uh, a lot of his poetry is non non rhyming, non like uh, uh, metered per se, but still highly poetic. Um, whereas like here, not only do we have meter, but we have like like uh, it's almost, and I don't mean this negatively, but it's almost doggerel in that like. It's like a, a, a very specific line with two rhymes, like it's rhyme after yeah. rhyme, rhyme after rhyme, um, that actually ha it gives it kind of a um, uh, a, a sim like a sort of a deceptive simplicity that that pulls yeah. you in in a way, uh, at least in in I think the the famous ones like the, the like Tiger Tiger kind of thing. Breath, um, yes. uh, uh, so yeah, that's that's maybe just when you said uh, understood by children, like that actually make, makes me think that that's that's a very intentional. Yeah. accessibility choice you know and, and a couple of comments i'll make in terms of the poetics i mean blake's blake is exceptionally now i'm biased of course i'm going to say the following mm -hmm. but blake is incredibly gifted as a poet but but what i mean by this is actually technically blake is incredibly gifted as a poet so so there's times actually you find lots of them in the notebooks where it is actually doggerel um when Klopstock England defied which was not intended for public consumption it ends with Blake you know, Klopstock um, the you know the German epic poet who Blake was forced to read by Haley and hated him and it ends with Blake defeating Klopstock while sitting on the toilet um, I'll let you fill in the details from your imagination and it's it's doggerel it is yeah. literal doggerel it's basically I can't even bother to write more than literal shite which is what he said that's how I'm going to deal with you <laughs> um, it, it, the most sophisticated element is that um, if you take Songs of Innocence and Experience, which of course is Blake's most famous, you mentioned the tiger, 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 burning bright, this relentless pounding rhythm. Mm -hmm. now, Blake himself seems to have had a real facility for rhythm. 
and I'll ignore mm. the rhyme for a moment. I'll just draw attention to this, the, the meter. Um, my favorite poem by Blake, which I gave the title to my book, you know, The Divine Image, to mercy, pity, peace, and love all pray in their distress, and to these virtues of delight return their thankfulness. It ends, and, and all must love the human form in heathen Turk or Jew, where mercy, love, and pity dwell, their God is dwelling too. Now this, metrically, this is perfect. It's kind of, you know, it works mm. in these quatrains, absolutely fantastically balanced it's so easy to memorize because it's a song it's sing song uh, 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 not doggerel it, that is a song and it kind of gets into your bloodstream and into your bones mm -hmm. which i think is i think just a quick thing uh, i'm only saying i was only like doggerel is meant more like as a as a tease i think oh yeah yeah, yeah. But, but blake yeah. did write dog and he was very good <laughs> Turn it out, you know, bang, bang, yeah, yeah. bang. You know, if he didn't like people, he'd write these little scathing quatrains and couplets that were <laughs> deliberately rubbish poetry. You know, I can't even be bothered to write good poetry about you, but I've got <laughs> this anger off my chest. Then the other end, um, in, in Jerusalem, the emanation of Giant Albion, he gives this preface in which he says he wants to write a work like Milton, but Milton was constrained by metre. Milton wrote in blank. Milton tried to escape rhyming couplets and, and you know, sort of the, the classical styles by writing in blank verse from Shakespeare. But even that creates bondage for him. So, so in Jerusalem, Blake says, I'm going to write the prose eight parts in prose. I'm going to write um, his favorite meter in his later works was the, the 14, uh, these long, rambling, expansive lines. But just to show how incredibly inventive he was at the beginning of the marriage of heaven and hell he writes this actually incredibly difficult poem I, I mean i love the marriage of heaven and hell and i teach a lot i still don't really understand the prologue and i say this you know in all honesty as a scholar of 30 years when i read the prologue to the marriage of heaven and hell that rincher wandering through you know the the the, the wild ways and planting roses and then the 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 the, 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 the sinister man follows him kind of recognize it's an allegory but i'm not 100 percent sure what the allegory is what's more important is that that i think it was jack Lindsay, the blake scholar said that this is actually the first recorded instance in western poetry of free verse a verse that is deliberately unmetrical mm. this by you know the the non-university educated writer that most people weren't reading in the 1780s and 1790s Blake could produce far superior metrical verse. I mean, even as a young boy, you know, even the poetical sketches, um, how sweet I roam from field to field, uh, it, it, which we, the fugs tended the wonder, my favorite, one of my favorite Blake's songs set to music. Um, incredibly lyrical, uh, precise uh, prosody. But he then produced the first free verse because he wanted to break the bondage of rhyme and uh, rhythm. Mm. Yeah. Well, we should get into some of the Gnostic mythos because I know um, some of the listeners <laughs> yes. and viewers who are, who are who are the hard Gnostic heads who don't exactly. Don't, uh, but everybody who watches uh, is, of course, a great appreciator of art. And one of the, the recently seems to be one of the points of this show is to really talk about the connections uh, between art and this stuff. But uh, the, Jason Whitaker, if you could uh, tell us a little bit about this mythology he constructed and some of the figures yes. in it. And I know, of course, it's very elaborate, so uh, <laughs> do your best to fit it in. So, so, yeah, um, I mean, if you take certain elements where Blake seems to... That, that there are a couple of critics. Um, Kathleen Rain is the most famous, who, who basically, you know, Blake is very much plugged into that Gnostic tradition and a kind of a an occult tradition at the same time um and that a key link between them is although, although swedenborg is not a gnostic necessarily in that sense but you know leads into that that tradition of theosophy as it develops in the 19th century um wb yates actually he he, he this is his blake blake is that kind of theosophist gnostic mystic in a very clear tradition of thinkers going back to the, the at the very least the pagan classical world if not beyond i am skeptical of that and the reason why i say i'm skeptical of that is that um i so what we'd have to do is to obviously define terms of what we mean by gnosticism in this particular one um where where the kind of theosophists who emerge out of Swedenborg system and, and Yeats, I'll pick Yeats as an example of this. Yeats is more of a Swedenborgian than he is a Blakean, which is a controversial thing to say because Yeats quotes Blake so much. Yeats is so clearly influenced by Blake. But what 
Yeats is looking for is the system of correspondence between the the world, you know, the, the divine world up there and the, the, the profane world down here. He wants the pathway that will lead him to transcendence. Um, Blake, Blake just wanders down the street and sees an angel in the window, you know. Um, Blake, Blake, <laughs> Blake doesn't need the path. He doesn't need the ladder. I and mean, it goes back to an early comment question you'd asked, Jason, you know, is art the ladder to the divine? No, art is the divine. You don't need mm. the ladder. You're already there. Um, so, so, but that, so, so I think actually if you treat Gnosticism as the recognition of the divine spark that's within all of us, Blake is clearly a Gnostic, he just calls it poetic genius or he calls it imagination, um, but everybody is born with this for Blake. It, 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 and, and actually the, 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 the great tragedy of the universe is that we forget it. You know, um, and in that sense, I mean, he seems fairly close to you know Neoplatonism or, or, or various elements like that. The, the, the you know the, the soul entering the body and then lose becoming immersed in materiality. However, even that's dangerous because in the Marriage of Heaven and Hell, Blake is very anti-dualism. You know, the body is the raw material of the soul. Um, he says that, you know, the senses are the main means by which spirit enters into this age. Uh, but it, 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 is, it is soul and spirit that is combined with imagination. So, I, I say strict. Uh, there, there are certain, for me, there have been certain fairly rigid approaches to Gnosticism that are kind of, you know, you, you, need, you need this series of belief systems. If, we're gonna, if we follow that route, Blake is not a Gnostic. If we follow the notion that actually what Blake as an artist is trying to do is to recuperate the sense of the divine that is in everyone and is open to everyone and, you know, and doesn't, doesn't rely on a sense of sin, who was mentioned at the beginning of the program, um, he's very much part of that tradition. What was the comment I was just going to make? Um, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, no, it's gone. Um, <laughs> I, I have maybe like a, like sort of more the, the Blake fan question. Uh, sorry, because I think that was a great, um, like for, for me, the question of like, in so-and-so a Gnostic, uh, uh, I think the question of whether or not they correspond to strict definitions of Gnosticism is something I'm less personally interested in. Um, and I'm more about like, what what are the, what are the rhymes with Gnostic ideas? Um, but speaking more, like maybe if we shifted to Blake fan mode, um, how just would you describe the the Blakeian mythology? Like if you just had to kind of like, um, <laughs> if this were like a, a like a, a fantasy novel series where you were like, oh yeah, okay, this is what the setting is like. So, <laughs> okay. Actually, the, one of the examples I'll give um, and, and, and not because of necessarily the themes, etc., but you, you, the, you know, the Thomas Covenant novels, mm -hmm. where it's quite clear that, the, you know, the land is, um, as we've learned towards the end of the series, you know, this is, a, this, is, this is an imagined landscape that is created by a dying man. Um, and it, it is final instances of life before we get into the final trilogy that wasn't a trilogy in a quadrilogy and just blew it oh, off as too <laughs> tedious. Um, but, 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 but actually, think, so, so what we have is that we have um, his mythology is a vision of, of actually literally a dying man. He describes Albion as falling onto the couch of death. And in that moment of dissolution, his, his harmonious internal life is falling apart. It's a psychomachia. It's a battle of reason, of the body, of um, emotion and passion, of, of instinct. Um, and what happens is that, that this internal psychology is falling apart. And thus what we have is, is the war between the Zoas. They are all striving. One of the things when you read the four Zoas is, you all of them are going, no, I'm God. No, I'm God. No, I'm the creator of everything. And what they are all trying to do is they're trying to exercise power. It, actually, strictly speaking, they are all God. <laughs> what they haven't realized is that being God is actually no big thing. Um, there's, there's a great comment, again, with Henry Crabb Robinson, in which, it, which Blake says, you know, um, yes, Jesus Christ is the only God, and so am I, and so are you. Um, <laughs> so if, if only the Zoas could realize that, yes, they are the only God, and so is every other Zoa. 
And um, that is the moment at which they'll achieve that kind of humility that will allow them actually to come back together. Because of course, what, what they've entered into is this battle, this conflict. Um, another way that I often think about it in kind of, you know, the, contemporary terms, and, and, and this reflects my, my frustration with a lot of contemporary myth-making, is it's kind of, it's, it's um, Marvel comics, the, the Marvel universe, where actually the hero is a person who doesn't kill others or use violence. And that is actually, that, that reflects to me the real paucity of a lot of modern myth-making, which cannot conceive of heroism without violence. Mm. Um, and this is actually a really profound point that, that it only comes to Blake gradually um, over his life. So in the 1790s, he's kind of like, you know, I'm very much part of the classics. I'm in this classical tradition as an artist, visual artist, you know, it's all beefcake and perfect ideal forms. <laughs> At the end of his life, he's kind of like, um, it is the classics. It's the classics that condemn us to eternal war. And what he means, I, I, I hadn't read <laughs> Homer's Iliad for 30 years. It's like, you know, the Robert Fagel's translation of my bookshelf. <laughs> I picked it up a couple got, of years ago. I've got the it. same one over here. I was reading it and I was going, wow, this is so readable and it's so horrific. <laughs> these, are, <laughs> these are murderers, these are rapists, these are violent, destructive figures. And Blake, hate, Blake hated what they had done to Western civilization, that the valorization of the hero as the epitome of power is actually what his books are very much trying. And that's why he's ultimately a Christian. What, his view of Christianity is strange heretical and, and all the rest of it but he's ultimately a christian he is actually concerned mm. with themes of humility of forgiveness of sin his divine image is not power strength and glory it is mercy pity peace and love hmm. um jason you, you mentioned uh, in passing the the figure of urizen uh yes, or yes yes can you, can you tell us a, a bit about this this figure in in blake's mythology yes um urizen is satan he says this several times urizen it, and, and actually, I'll, I'll emphasize Satan, not the devil, because the devil in marriage of heaven and hell, you know, the voice of kind of difficult truths. Eurizen, he starts off the misguided father of men. He, Eurizen, who is Satan. And throughout, you know, Milton, a poem towards the end of his career, it is Eurizen who descends as Satan. And Blake and Loss stand inside this ruined figure of ma a man, a man who doesn't realize he's a man, who thinks he's a god. And actually, that is a moment of the terrible despair. So uh, I suppose that the connections to kind of Gnostic mythology or, or certainly you know, those occult traditions, etc. Eurizen is, is very often held up as a demiurge. He is, and this is very clear in the book of Eurizen, where there is a pre-existing cosmos. But Eurizen does not like that cosmos, so sets out to create his own. But in creating his own, he creates this fallen, limited um, world that that is very restrictive. It's full of boundaries. Um, Eurizen, another way to think of Eurizen is that Eurizen is the god of this world, you know, so from Pauline uh, elements of the New Testament and St. Paul. Eurizen is the figure that people worship thinking they're worshipping God, but they're actually worshipping the devil because they're worshipping power, they're worshipping glory, they're worshipping strength, they're worshipping reason. And and one of the things that's absolutely fascinating to me, and, and I, I'm going to be doing a, a paper on this, uh, I'm a, uh, so part of a book that's going to be coming out hopefully next year, certainly in the next couple of years, I'm doing a discussion of Blake's illustrations to Paradise Regained, which I'm not written about very much. You know, everybody writes about Paradise Lost. Not many people write about Paradise Regained. And Paradise Regained obviously deals with the myth of, um, well, sorry, the story of Christ going into the wilderness and being tempted by Satan. In Blake's illustrations, Satan appears in the guise of an old man with a long white beard, uh, wearing sort of priestly cumdruidic robes. He is Eurism. Yeah. The, figure that, the figure that tempts Christ is the God of this world. Is, you know, sort of become, worship me, worship power, worship the guy on the clouds. And I will give you the world, and and the ultimate act of Christianity is Christ. No, that's not God. That's not the divine. The divine is being human. And, and actually, just to end on that, that, that there's an inc it, this doesn't mention the name Eurism, but in, in Blake's final illuminated work, The Ghost of Abel, which he wrote in response to Byron's Cain, a mystery. Um, in Byron's Cain, Cain is kind of the the typical Byronic hero. He is 
more sinned against than sinning is mistaken, capable of evil acts, but ultimately a figure of misguided goodness. So, so the, the ghost of Abel is about the ghost of Abel calling out for retribution, for revenge, for blood. He wants Cain to die. And Jehovah appears and sort of says, no, I'm going to, I've given Cain a mark that will stop him. It will stop like for like, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, that sort of thing. And the devil, Satan, rises out of Abel's grave. And, and he's, the, the curse that he gives, which I think is actually astonishing, is Jehovah, O oh, thou human. <laughs> Satan curses God because God recognizes that he is human. Satan, by trying to become more than human, has become less. Right? Mm. Is, oh, I mean, so Urizen is the, the figure, you know, Orc is another one, but actually Orc disappears from Blake's later work. Urizen never disappears. Urizen was, Urizen was probably Blake's strongest contribution to theology in some respects. The recognition, there is a name for the God of this world and we can see him. And when we see him clearly, we can understand our folly and our mistakes. Yeah, mm, I think that's probably so setting off some, some resemblances and uh, some connections <laughs> to, uh, to a lot of our audience. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Jason, it's, it's, it's been amazing. And uh, uh, as I often say, but it's true as we near the end of the show, it's like, just go for hours, but you <laughs> also probably have a life. But we can't wrap up with, you know, I should have announced this at the, at the top of the show to make sure that, and I'm, I know everybody's listening all the way through, but saving, saving the sex to the end. Uh, uh, Jason, the paraphrase, another Blake scholar. <laughs> Why was Mrs. Blake crying? Uh, why, uh, can you tell us a, a bit about uh, William okay. Blake's ideas about sexuality? I shall. Um, um, I have. I have to do so with a slight apology because the author of that book, Martha Keith Souchard, I wrote a very scathing review of that book, in which I said that it had been it it, it, it was taking some very slender evidence and expanding it and, and forgive me. This is the bit where you know the scholar in me can't sit. You know where where where, where are the receipts? Um, and, and she wrote to me afterwards and said, actually, you know, there was an element of truth this, that, that she suggested certain things and the publisher were kind of like, oh, no, no, we've got to sex that up. So the, the why Mrs. Blake cried, um, the, the, the allegation, probably with some basis, was that, that when Blake had joined the, the New Jerusalem Church, the, 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 the cult that was starting to emerge around Swedenborg at that time, and there were a certain number of members who believed that, you know, effectively trying to break up the, the integrity or the, the single-minded nature of monogamy. And this take, you know, that, that taking concubines was actually a biblical tradition and we should do this. And so the story is that Blake suggested they take a concubine um, as part of this. Now, where I get rid now, now that, there may, that there may be the receipts for that, as it were. Where I took issue with um, Sushar's book was that she then went into this fairly elaborate system of kind of tantric sexuality, where I was going, yeah, uh, there, were, there were figures in the late 18th century who were starting to explore this in London, but they were very much of a, they were part of a kind of elite circle, social circle that Blake had no access to. So I kind of, you know, I want to know where he draws this. Blake's views on sexuality, however, I mean, they're, they're incredibly fascinating. They're also very complex. And actually, they're, they're part of Blake's writing that are the least appealing to me personally, because I also think there's a strong danger, particularly as he gets older, that it's, there are strong elements of misogyny that come through. So Blake himself, he starts from part of this fallen universe is the recognition of difference in sexuality. Um, so, you know, the, the, the story of God creating Eve from the rib of Adam. Blake takes that as actually, that's the false God, Eurizen, dividing sexuality. Uh, th there are some arguments that Blake is fundamentally kind of trans, that rather like Milton in Paradise Lost, where the, the, there's a wonderful, is it book seven, book eight? The, 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 the description by Raphael, I think it is, when Adam says, you know, basically, so, so what's it like when you have sex in heaven? And, and Raphael gives this, astonishing account of how angels their entire bodies kind of merge and melt and you know there's it's not genital tech sex it's entire corporate corporeal or this superhuman merging of every atom of their being and blake seems, seems to have some sense that you know that there is this kind of this pre-fallen sexuality which can attain to the state of bliss Unfortunately, the language he uses to explain, express the fall is that, oh yeah, and then the female became separated and the female is an inferior version of the male. And, and it, it's very hard for him to escape 
straightforward misogynist patterns of thought. He gets trapped in, in a, a knot that he cannot untangle. And um, one of my students who is doing a lot of work in the four zoos at the moment, we often have this discussion about if Blake had simply made two of his zoas female, he could have solved so many of his problems. But because they're all male, the female essentially becomes a fallen part. Mm, that doesn't help. Um, so Blake himself had incredibly complex views on sexuality. Um, one of the things, however, that I, I like and actually find more interesting, as I get a hold of reading to that, what you will, is actually probably more interested in Blake's ideas on love. Because mm. a, a few years ago, I was asked to give a talk. It was a conference in Portugal, Porto, and they wanted me to talk about Catherine and William. And, and I come to this pain to the two of them, because if you, if you take the romantic period, wow, wow, the men were heels. I mean, you know, Byron's, <laughs> yeah. Byron's, you know Byron, Byron'd be great if you're a guy. Byron's great to go for a drink for. Byron'd be great for an adventure. But you sure as hell didn't want to be a woman around him. Mad, bad, you know, so. You know, yeah. Uh, but, but also just actually slimy. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and that this happened, uh, you know, and Coleridge, in a very different sense, you know, just buckering off to go and live in Germany for two years while his wife's raising, you know, Sarah's raising the kids. Uh, and, and basically, you know, becoming a junkie and all the rest of it, while, while, he, while, while Robert Southey, who's very devoted to, to his wife, actually looks after Coleridge's family as well. So actually, one of the things that's really touching to me is that, that, that on Blake's deathbed, it is Catherine who is beside him. It's Catherine who is drawing at the last moment. And actually, for me, in some respects, it's the love that's more important than the sex. And it's not that they're mutually exclusive. Blake wouldn't have accepted that at all. You know, he's, he's no Puritan, wrong word, but you know, you know what I mean? I'm using shorthand there. He is no, no denier of the pleasures of the flesh. Indeed, imagination is to enhance the pleasures of the flesh. Uh, but it's actually, in the end, it is his love that he feels for Catherine. That is the most important thing that probably happens to him in his life. Well, uh, that's probably a, a good place to, to wrap up, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, Jason, if you could tell people, uh, you know, about your books, where to find you online, all that good stuff, to get those plugs out. Yeah, so, um, so zoomorphosis.com, that, that's kind of my blog that I've been running for 10 years. And I, I mainly write about the reception of Blake, his influence on later artists and journalists. My most recent book, he said, I should have pulled this to hand, is um, The Divine Image, the Divine Images, the life and work of William Blake. Uh, and it's uh, the reason I would actually recommend this one start, as well as attempting to explain Blake's life in a great deal of detail, is that it's, it's, it's the first book I've done which has a huge number of illustrations as well. So I talk about the art as well as the poetry. Um, and one to keep an eye out if you're interested, which deals much more with kind of politics and reception, is one that will be coming out next year on Jerusalem. Uh, Blake Parry and the fight for Englishness. Uh, so very much, you know, kind of questions of national identity and how it's been, Blake's words have been taken and used and abused in the past century. Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much. Well, I have a quick plug, which is uh, mileendmeditation.substack.com. I do uh, free, uh, open, secular, psychology-based uh, mindfulness meditation, whatever you want to call it. It's not specifically Gnostic, but if you are a Gnostic or spiritual, you will probably get a lot out of it. And if you're not, well, you come on out. It's uh, 11 a.m. Sunday mornings uh, and uh, mileends, uh, meditation com. so you can see the schedule and all that good stuff. Um, Jason Memo, any plugs? Uh, just uh, uh, the theater company that I work with, Sage Theater. Uh, we're doing all kinds of uh, stuff over the summer with emerging artists. So tune into that. There's going to be some interdisciplinary work, uh, a, sort of a playwright podcast, uh, some dance work. So I think, uh, yeah, tune in at sagetheater.com. And then anything that isn't specifically Sage Theater related, it's just my name, jasonmemmel.com, um, which uh, you can find all that stuff there. Now, actually, uh, before we sign off, uh, and maybe we trim this out of the episode if it's not, um, uh, if if if, there, if the answer to this is no. But uh, Jason Whitaker, would you be willing to read us a divine image like the the poem? I would indeed. In fact, I'll I'll try and recite it from memory because it is really important to me. To mercy, pity, peace, and love all pray in their distress, and to these virtues of delight return their thankfulness. For mercy, pity, peace, and love is God our Father dear. And mercy, pity, peace, and love is man his child and care. 
For mercy has a human heart and peace the human face, and love that peace the human form divine and love the human dress. Then every man in every clime that prays in his distress, prays to the human form divine, love, mercy, pity, peace. And all must love the human form in heathen Turk or Jew, where mercy, love, and pity dwell. Their God is dwelling too. Amazing. Well, the perfect place to end. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. <laughs>